Dear viewers, I have an exciting announcement for you all. This is about the pre-storming test series. Pre-storming is the most reliable prelims test series offered by Shankar IAS Academy. Already two batches are going on successfully. Now for those who have missed to enroll in these batches, a third chance is awaiting. Yes, pre-storming batch 3 is starting on November 9th. The first test in this batch will commence on 20th November. Like the other two batches, it will also have 66 tests. So, go and register today to enhance your prelim score. With this information, let me welcome you all to the Hindu Daily News Analysis for the date 7th of November 2022. The articles taken up for today's discussion are displayed here. Interested aspirants can go through it. With this, let's start our first article discussion. Take a look at this text and context article. See, it focuses on various aspects of Uniform Civil Code. The aspects include the opinion of Constituent Assembly regarding UCC, diverging arguments regarding UCC, the opinion of the Supreme Court and the opinion of the Law Commission. This is all about the article written here. In this discussion, we will discuss these points in detail. The syllabus for this article is highlighted here for your reference. You can go through it. With this, let's start the discussion. Now, firstly, coming to the question, what is Uniform Civil Code? Currently, there are different personal laws for each religion that govern various aspects like marriage, divorce, adoption and inheritance. Often, these personal laws are at conflict with one another. The UCC is a common law that is said to replace all the personal laws in our country. So, basically, we can say that UCC is a separate set of common rules that mainly deals with the personal matters like marriage, divorce, inheritance, etc. without any religious bias. Now, coming to the constitutional provisions regarding UCC. In our constitution, Uniform Civil Code is mentioned in Article 44. It says that the state shall endeavor to secure for the citizens a uniform civil code throughout the territory of India. As Article 44 is placed under DPSPs, the citizens cannot compel the government to implement it. That is, the directive principles of the state policy is not enforceable. But as we all know, directive principle of state policy guides the government in the governance of the country. So, the government is now making an effort for the implementation of the Uniform Civil Code. The support for the Uniform Civil Code is not new in India. Even our nation's freedom fighters felt the need for the UCC. This is particularly because of the colonial government's divide and rule policy. The colonial government opted not to interfere with the religious customs of Indians. This was part of the divide and rule policy of the British government. So, the national leaders even before independence felt the need for UCC. See, the Uniform Civil Code has several significance in our modern democracy. So, now let us see the need for UCC in India right now. Firstly, UCC is needed to ensure gender justice. See, every religious personal law is biased against women. One such example is that in almost all personal laws, men are provided special status in succession and inheritance affairs. So, when UCC is implemented, these discriminatory provisions can be removed. This will help address disparity and ensure equality among genders. Now, coming to the second need, which is nothing but UCC can ensure unity among the Indian population. One of the major threats to our national unity and integration is resentment or bitterness between people of different religions. This is due to the differential treatment of different religions by law. For example, while Muslims are permitted to marry many times in India, a Hindu or a Christian will face prosecution for doing the same. If UCC is implemented, this can be addressed. This will help the cause of national unity. Now, coming to the next point. See, UCC has a potential to promote secularism in India. For a modern secular country like India, UCC is necessary. A common law for all the citizens rather than different law based on religious practices will be line with India's secular ideals. Fourthly, UCC can prevent vote bank politics. You know that some political parties are involved in vote bank politics during elections for their own personal gains. Currently, different religions have different personal laws. Due to this, the political parties politicize the issues of discrimination and concessions. 
But if UCC is implemented all throughout the country, this can be completely eradicated. Finally, UCC is the need of the hour for India to keep up with global progress. Having a UCC has become a sign of modern democracy. As India aspires to be a global power, having a UCC will help it to project itself as a secular country among the world nations. These are some of the needs for the implementation of UCC in India. Even though there are some advantages associated with UCC, it is still not being implemented in India. So there must be some difficulty associated with its implementation, right? So now let us see the difficulties in the implementation of UCC in India. First comes the issue of plurality in law. People who argue for UCC say that India has uniformity in criminal and civil matters like the Criminal Procedure Code and Civil Procedure Code. But what the supporters of UCC ignore is that state governments have made over 100 amendments to the said Criminal Procedure Code and the Indian Penal Code. So as plurality already exists in the civil and criminal laws, aiming for uniformity in the personal laws in a diverse country like India is a difficult task. Now moving on to see the next difficulty. See, the diversity of India acts as an impediment for the implementation of the UCC. For example, marriages among close relatives are prohibited by the Hindu Marriage Act of 1955. But they are considered auspicious in the south of India. So, one monolithic law that addresses all the intricacies of Indian society is difficult to come forth with. The other issue is the diversity in personal laws. See, Within the same religion itself, there is diversity in personal law. For example, Muslim personal law is not applicable in Jammu and Kashmir. In JNK, the Muslims continue to be governed by customary law. In some instance, this customary law is in conflict with the Muslim personal law that is applied in the rest of the country. Even for Hindus, we do not have a single personal law. We have Hindu Marriage Act, the Hindu Succession Act, the Hindu Minority and Guardianship Act, the Hindu Adoptions and Maintenance Act to address the diversity. So, aiming for a UCC for the whole of India is not in the right direction. Now, coming to the fourth issue. It is nothing but the constitutional hurdle. Article 25 of the Indian Constitution, which comes under the Fundamental Rights category, guarantees the right to freedom of religion, subject to public order, morality and health. So, implementing UCC will come in direct conflict with Article 25. Also note that personal law is placed in the concurrent list in Schedule 7 of the Indian Constitution. This shows that the Constitution makers anticipated a plurality in personal law. If the makers of the Indian Constitution felt the need for a uniform personal law for the whole of India, they might have placed the personal law in central list. But they didn't do so, which shows that they allowed for plurality in laws. This is all with respect to the issues associated with the implementation of UCC in India. Now, let's see the insights provided by the Law Commission on the issue of Uniform Civil Code. The Law Commission in a 2018 consultation paper mentioned that there is no need for uniformity in a unified country like India. The Law Commission also quoted that plurality in personal law is not a threat to our country's secularism. It also added that Uniform Civil Code is not necessary and desirable for our country at this particular juncture. Instead, focus must be placed on removing the discriminatory practices in every religion's personal law itself. We have seen the difficulties in the implementation of UCC and also about the opinion of the Law Commission with regard to UCC. Now, let us see the opinion of the Supreme Court in regards to this matter. The Supreme Court took a different approach to that of the Law Commission. Take Muhammad Ahmad Khan vs Shah Bano Begum case for example. The case concerned the woman seeking maintenance after being divorced under triple talaq, which is a personal law. In this case, the section 125 of the Criminal Procedure Code came in conflict with the Muslim personal law. The Supreme Court in its judgment gave prevalence to section 125 of the Criminal Procedure Code and judged that the Muslim women are entitled to alimony. In this judgment, the Supreme Court highlighted the need for Uniform Civil Code. The other cases in which the Supreme Court reiterated the need for Uniform Civil Code include 1955 Sarla Mudgal case, 2001 Daniel Latifi case and 2006 Polo Cotino vs Maria Luisa Valentina Pereira case. So finally, what should be actually done regarding UCC? We can look back and say that 
द स्टेटमेंट मेड बै बी आर अंबेकर् रिगार्डिंग यूसी स्टिल रिमैं वेलिड बाबा साहेब सेड आटिकल फार्टि फोर मियर्ली स्टेट दट स्टेट शाल एंडेवर टू सेक्यूर ऐ यूसी and nowhere in article 44 it is mentioned that the government can impose uniform civil code on its people so going by this iteration the ucc must be purely voluntary with this we have come to the end of this discussion through this discussion we have seen about the term uniform civil code what is it the significance of it in the present indian democracy the need for ucc in our country and also about the impediments which are in the way against the implementation of the ucc with this information now let's move on to the next news article take a look at this news article from the day before yesterday's newspaper this is about the demise of the legendary figure in post independent india elaben but she founded the self employed women association it is one of the most innovative and successful experiments in india in the field of social development this is about the news article given here in this context let us see some details about this self employed women association this discussion is important for your mains preparation in the gs paper 1 role of women and women organizations are asked in the mains exam so kindly make use of this discussion we will start with the history of self employed women association see seva was born out of the women's wing of textile laborers association this textile labor association was one of the oldest and largest union of textile workers founded by anushriya sarabhai and mahatma gandhi in the year 1920 here know that the original purpose of the women's wing was to provide training in sewing knitting spinning and embroidery to the wives and daughters of the mill workers the present version of the seva was born as a trade union of poor self employed women in 1972 in agamadabad gujarat now with this information let us see why such an organization is important in india see women belong to the most vulnerable portion of the population poor working women constitute the vast unprotected working population of our country see they also constitute a significant part of the indian women labor force that is of the small number of working women in india 94 percentage were self employed in the informal sector so they are called as informal workers and only a few labor laws take them into account so what does this mean this means that the significant contribution done by poor women workers are largely undercounted or sometimes uncounted here is where organizations such as seva becomes very relevant seva's goals are twofold one is providing full time employment to women and the other is self reliance see poor women workers are generally informal and they do not have a formal employer employee agreement so this means that they don't enjoy the social security benefits that comes with it only if they get social security benefits then the employment will be full employment here seva makes sure that the women get work security income security food security and also social security so what does this mean this means that seva provides health care child care insurance pension etc now coming to the second goal that is self reliance see self reliance is nothing but the ability to work individually and collectively it is to achieve economic freedom and retain decision making powers over the matters that concern our lives in this line seva has launched many initiatives i will provide a few of them see in the year 1974 seva bank was established to provide small loans to poor women this initiative was recognized by the international labor organization as a micro finance movement nextly a clothing line called hansiba by seva had collaborated with french and british designers to take the ethnic embroidery of gujarat to the world market this was also done only through women along with it in agamadabad seva runs a cafe that serves affordable hot gujarati and south indian meals here also note that during the pandemic seva launched anubandh It is an e-commerce platform to connect sellers with buyers and to keep kitchen fires burning throughout the lockdown. See, these are all the initiatives that elevated the position of women in the male-dominated world. Now, you know the importance of women organization in the country through the example of Seva. Such institutions does not only simply empower women, but it also bring changes in the political forum. For example, the unorganized women social security act 2008 the national rural livelihood mission 2011 and the street vendors act 2014 are the successes 
ஆஃப் சேவா ஸ்ட்ரகிள் லாஸ்ட்லி த பிஎம் ஸ்ட்ரீட் வெண்டர்ஸ் ஆத்ம நிர்பார் நிதி விச் இஸ் ஷார்ட்லி கால்ட் ஆஸ் பிஎம் சுவாநிதி இஸ் ஆல்சோ சீன் ஆஸ் அன் இன்ஸ்பிரேஷன் ஆஃப் சேவாஸ் மைக்ரோ ஃபினான்ஸ் மாடல் த்ரூ திஸ் டிஸ்கஷன் வி ஹவ் சீன் அபவுட் அ உமன் ஆர்கனைசேஷன் கால்டு சேவா இட்ஸ் வேரியஸ் இனிஷியேட்டிவ்ஸ் அண்ட் ஹவ் சேவா ப்ராட் சேஞ்சஸ் இன் தி பொலிட்டிக்கல் ஃபோரம் வித் தீஸ் இன்ஃபர்மேஷன் நவ் லெட் அஸ் மூவ் ஆன் டு தி நெக்ஸ்ட் நியூஸ் ஆர்டிக்கல் டிஸ்கஷன் டேக் அ லுக் அட் திஸ் ஆர்டிக்கல் As the name suggests, it's about the discovery of a new honeybee species in the Western Ghats region. The honeybee species is named Apis carinjodian. It is given the common name, the Indian Black Honeybee. This species of honeybee got evolved from Apis carana or the Asian honeybee. See, it got acclimated to the hot and humid environment of the Western Ghats and evolved into a separate subspecies. So, in this context, Let's see the importance of honeybees in our ecosystem. The first importance is that these honeybees ensures biodiversity in the area in which they inhabit. We all know that one of the important roles played by honeybees is pollination. As pollinators, bees play an important part in every aspect of the ecosystem. They support the growth of trees, flowers and other plants. In turn, trees, flowers and plants serve as food and shelter for other creatures. So, through pollination, the honeybees contribute to the existence of our interconnected ecosystems and allow a diverse number of different species to coexist. Through this, the bees helps in ensuring biodiversity. Now, coming to the second important function of the honeybees. The produce of honeybees, that is, honey act as a food source for other animals. See, bees produce honey to feed their colonies during the cold winter months. The honey produced by the bees is also used by other animals as their food source. Bees themselves are also a part of the larger food chain of the forest ecosystem. At least 24 species of birds including the blackbird, hummingbird and starling prey on bees. Many spiders and insects like dragonflies and praying mantises eat bees as well. So, the existence of bees is necessary for the survival of the forest food chain now coming to the third important function of the honey bees in the ecosystem honey bees helps in conserving indigenous trees here note that bees produce good quality honey when they collect pollen from a variety of flora so to collect pollen from different types of trees and plants they do a lot of work due to this they help in the pollination of indigenous trees and indirectly help in their conservation all these shows that without honey bees our forests will not be diverse our gardens will be bare and habitats of birds and animals will decline so ultimately conserving honey bees is important for the survival of us humans with this we have come to the end of this discussion through this discussion we have seen about the new species of honey bees which were discovered in the western ghats region we came to know about its name and also about the importance of honey bees in the larger forest ecosystem with these points now let us move on to the next news article have a look at this news article this news article talks about the plane crash that occurred in lake victoria in tanzania it has been reported that 19 people died as the plane plunged into water while approaching the northwestern city of bukavo in the country this disaster ranks among the deadliest plane crashes in the east african nation's history so this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us learn about the lake victoria in prelims perspective see lake victoria is also known as victoria nyanza it is one among the african great lakes here note that it is the africa's biggest lake and also the largest tropical lake in the world in terms of surface area it is the second largest freshwater lake present in the world Lake Victoria is also well known as the source of the longest branch of the Nile River that is the White Nile. Now coming to the geographical location of the lake. See it lies mainly in Tanzania and Uganda but some parts of it is also present in the country Kenya. This is all with respect to the geography of the lake. Now let's see the economical importance of this lake. The lake has more than 200 species of freshwater fishes present in it. Among these the tilapia is the most economically important fish here note that the lake also acts as an inland water transport linkage for the three east african states that is uganda tanzania and kenya furthermore the lake is a major reservoir and source of water for domestic industrial and commercial purposes in these countries 
so we can understand that the lake serves as a fishing ground water source and even for producing power through hydroelectric power plants this is all with respect to the economical importance of the lake now coming to the present condition of the lake see the lake is threatened by the consequences of overfishing also it is threatened by ecological damage caused from pollution and invasive species such as the nile perch and water hyacinth let's see briefly about the invasive species water hyacinth it is a freshwater plant capable of vigorous growth in the water bodies it was introduced in the african continent as an ornamental plant in the early 20th century and since then it has spread rampantly in lake victoria the water hyacinth caused a reduction in fish this is through deoxygenation of water it blocked the in and outflows of the lake thus it led to disruption in the fishing activities it also acts as an impediment in the freer movement of transport of goods here also note that lake victoria is now being affected by eutrophication let me explain to you briefly about the term eutrophication see eutrophication is the process in which a water body becomes more enriched with nutrient this leads to excessive growth of algae and plankton in a water body which leads to the blockage of sunlight into the interior parts of the lake see eutrophication is considered to be a serious environmental concern this is because it often results in the deterioration of water quality thus eutrophic waters can eventually become dead zones that are incapable of supporting life with this we have come to the end of this discussion through this discussion we have seen about the lake victoria its geographical location and also about the economical significance of it in this discussion because of its importance in prelims exam see there are frequent questions regarding the lakes and its geographical location so kindly make note of what we discussed today it will be very much helpful for you in the prelims examination with this information now let's move on to the next news article have a look at this news article this news article talks about the recreation of a tribal hut by the anthropological survey of india this was done to showcase the heritage of tribal communities especially those of particularly vulnerable tribal groups all these are done to promote the unique heritage of tribes this is the crux of the news article given here so in this context let us learn about anthropological survey of india see the anthropological survey of india is the only research organization to pursue anthropological research in a governmental setup this anthropological survey of india's genesis was from the zoological and anthropological section of the indian museum this then became the zoological survey of india in the year 1916 but again in the year 1945 anthropology section of the zoological survey was carved out and it became the anthropological survey of india known today here note that the head office was shifted from banaras to kolkata in the year 1948 Now let's see the functions of the Anthropological Survey of India. See it conducts biocultural investigation and research on Indian population. For this it collects and preserves documents of scientific interest about the people of India. The survey through its anthropological research contributes to the biological, social and cultural heritage of the country. Now coming to the principal objectives of the Anthropological Survey of India firstly it tries to study the tribes and other communities that form the population of India this is both from the biological and the cultural point of view secondly it studies and preserves the human skeletal remains this is done from both ancient and contemporary period now coming to the third function anthropological survey of india also acts as a training center for students in anthropology fourthly it collects preserves maintains and documents the biocultural heritage additionally it collects preserves maintains the traditional art and craft of the people of india all these preservation are done through anthropological museums now coming to the final objective see it also acts as the institute which publishes the results of the anthropological researchers these are the five principal objectives of anthropological survey of india here note that anthropological survey of india is a premier research organization which functions under the ministry of culture just have a look at this image to know its headquarters and about its regional offices the regional offices are present in port blair shillong dehradun udaipur nagpur and mysore then in addition to this there are two field stations at jagdalpur and ranchi 
This is all about the brief information about Anthropological Survey of India. Through this discussion, we learned about the functions of Anthropological Survey of India and also about some of the key objectives of it. With this information, now let's move on to the next news article. Have a look at this article. This article talks about the copyright infringement. The news is that the Delhi High Court accepted that the use of music or audio recordings during marriage ceremonies is not a copyright infringement. This clears an area of law that has been ambiguous for so long. See, there has been a constant tussle between copyright owners and event management companies about the payment of royalties to play music at weddings. According to Section 52.1 of the Copyright Act of 1957, the use of certain copyrighted works for official ceremonies and bona fide religious ceremonies is not an act of copyright infringement. This is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us learn about the terms copyright, patent and trademark. Firstly, take copyright. See, copyright is a legal term used to describe the rights that creators have over their literary and artistic works. The work covered by copyright range from books, music, paintings, sculptures and films. It also extends to computer programs, databases, advertisements, maps and technical drawings. See, copyrights in India are governed by the Copyright Act 1957. The Act has been amended five times since then. The Copyright Amendment Act 2012 was the most substantial one. It was in this amendment, it was made to bring the Act in conformity with the two World Intellectual Organization Internet Treaties. They are the World Intellectual Property Organization Copyright Treaty and World Intellectual Property Organization Performances and Phonograms Treaty. The other important amendment done to the Copyright Act in 2012 is extension of copyright protection in the digital environment. Then exemption of copyrights for physically disabled was also done through this amendment. The purpose of these amendments is to protect the music and film industry, then to address the concerns of the physically disabled and to protect the interests of the author of any work, then to remove operational facilities and for the enforcement of rights. This is all with respect to the term copyright. Now coming to the next term that is patent. See, a patent is an exclusive right granted for an invention. It may be a product or a process that provides in general a new way of doing something or offers a new technical solution to a problem. New technological innovations can also be patented. Now coming to the question, how can a patent be brought? To get a patent, technical information about the invention must be disclosed to the public in a patent application. Once patented, the invention cannot be commercially made, used, distributed, imported or sold by others without the patent owner's consent. Here note that the protection is granted only for a limited period. Generally, it will be 20 years from the filing date of the application. Also know that the Patents Act 1970 is a principal law for patenting system in India. This came into force in the year 1972. It replaced the Indian Patents and Designs Act 1911. This act includes providing patents to all fields of technology including food, drugs, chemicals and microorganisms. Lastly, coming to the term trademark. See, a trademark is a sign capable of distinguishing the goods or services of one enterprise from those of the other enterprise. Trademark dates back to ancient times when artisans used to put their signature or mark on their products. Here note that trademarks in India are governed by the Trademarks Act 1999. This trademark gives the entity the right to prevent others from using its style of branding. This is all with respect to the term trademark. Through this discussion, we came to know about three important terms, which is nothing but copyright, patent and trademark. With these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article. Take a look at this article. It reports that in the month of October alone, 13 people were killed in India involving helicopter accidents. A conservative estimate based on incidents reports by the Directorate General of Civil Aviation shows that over 40% of commercial helicopter accidents were due to pilot errors. Other reasons include harsh weather which nearly accounted for 19% of these incidents. Cable hit incidents are also another reason. 
See, this is when a helicopter gets entangled in wires or cables used by locals in mountainous regions to transport goods. This particular incident accounts for 9% of these accidents. See, the cables are often not marked with warning signs and they will not be visible from a distance, especially when the weather is poor. These are the reasons given by the DGCA report for the repeated occurrences of helicopter accidents in India. So far, we saw the reasons for the accidents. Now, we will see about DGCA. First of all, DGCA is expanded as Directorate General of Civil Aviation. It is the regulatory body in the field of civil aviation primarily dealing with safety issues in India. It comes under the Ministry of Civil Aviation. This autonomous organization is responsible for the regulation of air transport services from and within India. See, it is also responsible for the enforcement of civil air regulations, air safety and air worthiness standards. With this information, now let us move on to see a few functions of DGCA. DGCA deals with the registration of civil aircrafts in India. It also licenses pilots, air maintenance engineers, air traffic controllers and flight engineers. It also serves the function of taking accident prevention measures such as formulation of implementation of safety aviation management programs in India. The other major functions of the DGCA are given here. You can pause the video and take a look. Here, one important thing to note that is DGCA only regulates the civil aviation industry present in India, while the military aviation industry is regulated by the Indian Air Force. With this, we have come to the end of this discussion. Through this discussion, we have seen some of the reasons for the increasing trend in helicopter accidents in India and also about the Civil Aviation Regulation Agency called DGCA. With this information, now let's move on to the next news article. Have a look at this article here. It is from yesterday's Sunday magazine. It is quite an interesting one when compared to the others that we have discussed today. When it comes to misogynic practices against women, we have heard stories related to Hinduism. But this article shows light on the misogynic practices present in Buddhism. And in this discussion, we are going to see examples in Buddhism where patriarchal practices were seen. See, Buddhist imagery appears 5 centuries after the death of Buddha. Here, the only woman of prominence in early Buddhist art is Buddha's mother. She is shown either conceiving Buddha or delivering him or being visited by her son in heaven. Only a fewer images shows his wife. You may think that Buddhism is male dominated because this involves difficult traditions. But there were many women who were inspired by Buddha's teachings and who were part of Jataka narratives. But none of them were depicted in the Buddhist art. Even Tara, a powerful Buddhist goddess, appears only 5 centuries after the first Buddhist era. After a thousand years into Buddhist art, Tantric ideas found its way into Buddhism. And after this, Buddhist images were seen explicitly showing sex and violence. Buddha and Bodhisattvas are shown having sex with female deities who are sources of power and knowledge. And this is when the female forms, the Dakshinis and Yoginis came into existence. In principle, the smaller female form embodies wisdom, also known as Pragna, and the larger male form embodies compassion. But in none of them, two forms are shown as equal. See, the code for Buddhist monks, Vinaya Pitaka, has more rules for women than men. It is an important point, so kindly note it. It is justified on the grounds of inherent inequality between the male and female biology. It says that the biology makes it easier for man to be more spiritual and woman to be more carnal. After an incident where woman had sex with a monk while he was sleeping under a tree, monks were advised to sleep indoors. Monks who voluntarily submit to female charms were declared defeated. As per inscriptions, women of the Satavahana period were major donors when Buddhist stupas were being built in the Deccan. But Jataka tales through which Buddhist ideas reached the common man are full of stories that see women as temptations to be feared. These stories projected women as persons to be admired only when they display sexual restraint. The stories present in Kunala Jataka is full of unfaithful, lustful, untrustworthy women. Apart from this, in Jataka tales, Buddha takes 550 forms and not even one of them is a woman form. 
See, there is this story of a nun called Subha who plucks out her eye and gives it to the man who keeps praising it. In Japan, there is this story of Yonen who burns her beautiful face so that she is allowed to enter the monastic order. So, even Buddhism had projected women to be physically weak, intellectually inferior and highly sensuous. So, the popularly held conception that Buddhism is a general neutral religion is wrong. This is all about this discussion. Through this discussion, we came to know about the discriminatory practices against women present in the Buddhism. With this, we have come to the end of first part of our discussion. Now, moving on to the second part, which is nothing but prelims practice question discussion. Today, I have taken five different questions for discussion. Let me start with the first question. See, this is a previous year question. Let me read out the question first. Which one of the following lakes of West Africa has become dry and turned into a desert? Just now, from our discussion, we have seen about Lake Victoria. See, Victoria is located in the eastern part of Africa. So, we can easily eliminate option 1. Now, finally, we have left with three options. But all these three options are located in the western side of Africa. To answer this question, you have to exactly know the lake which is becoming into a desert. The answer for this question is Lake Fagubin. Let me tell you a few facts relating Lake Fagubin. It is located in the country called Mali. In the 1970s, following increasingly disastrous periods of drought, the lake began to evaporate. You can see from the image given here how the place looks now. It looks like a white desert. The location of the other two lakes are provided here. You can pause the video and have a look. Now, coming to the second question. Let me read out the question first. Which one of the following is believed to be a compilation of psalms sung by the woman? The answer for this question is option B. If you have read the article from yesterday's Sunday magazine, you would have easily got this question right because the article reported about this also. Let me say a few facts relating Terigada. Terigada was an early collection of verses composed by women. This is one of the earliest Indian texts that gives voice to the woman, but it also reflects the traditional attitudes towards them. Here, women were considered physically weak, intellectually inferior and highly sensuous. So, it is said that they needed to be bound by marriage and maternity. Here, note that Terigada is a Buddhist text. Moving on to the third question. It is a two-statement question. Let me read out the question first. Consider the following statements regarding Directorate General of Civil Aviation, DGCA. First statement. Ministry of Civil Aviation exercises administrative control over the attached and autonomous organization of DGCA. Option 1 is correct. DGCA functions under the Ministry of Civil Aviation. About this, we have seen in the article discussion itself. Moving on to the second statement. DGCA coordinates all regulatory functions with International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO. This statement is also correct. DGCA carries out amendments to the rules and regulations to comply with the ICAO. It checks noise and emissions in accordance with ICAO annexes. So, the correct option for this question is option C both 1 and 2. Now, coming to the fourth question. It is also a two-statement question. Coming to the first statement. Both Anthropological Survey and Archaeological Survey of India comes under the Ministry of Culture. In today's discussion, we have discussed about Anthropological Survey of India. There is also a body called Archaeological Survey of India, which also comes under the Ministry of Culture. So, statement 1 is correct. Statement 2 is incorrect. Just now, we saw that the Archaeological Survey of India is regulating all archaeological activities in the country. So, statement 2 cannot be correct. Let me say a few facts relating to Archaeological Survey of India. See, it is a premier organization for archaeological researches and protection of the cultural heritage of the nation. The prime concern of the ASI is maintenance of ancient monuments, archaeological sites and remains of national importance. For this, the entire country is divided into circles. Then, it regulates all archaeological activities in the country as per the provisions of the Ancient Monuments and Archaeological Sites and Remains Act 1958. So, the correct answer for this question is option A, one only. Now, coming to the final question. It is also a two-statement question. Let me read out the question first. Consider the following statement. Statement 1. Trademark of an enterprise can be used by another enterprise. If you have listened to the today's article discussion, you would have got this statement correct. Yes, statement 1 is incorrect. See, trademark is a right. So, trademark of an enterprise cannot be used by another enterprise. Now, coming to the second statement. A process change in a technology can also be patented under the Patents Act. This statement is correct. See, a process change in a technology or a new technology both can be patented under the Patents Act. 
So the correct answer for this question is option B. Two only. The prelims practice question for you is displayed here. Interested aspirants can post the answer in the comment section. The mains practice question is displayed here. Interested aspirants can write your answers and post it in the comment section. With this, we have come to the end of our discussion. If you are liked our video, please hit the like button, do comment and share it with your friends. Thanks for watching.